I'll start off. You mentioned California yeah. behind. Where would you characterize? Where are we in Georgia on the continuum? Yeah, so my, my, my sense is that digital learning now uh, graded Georgia B, if I recall, um, on, on its state report card. Uh, which puts it in the top five, I think, uh, states uh, across the country in terms of having the policy landscape. I think where Georgia can move much more aggressively uh, is to having a, 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 a fuller course choice uh, program where, where dollars really followed students down to that individual course of, uh, of their choice and then paid in part for actual student success. Uh, if you look at what Utah and Louisiana and Florida have done, uh, so providers get paid a portion of the funds when students have actually successfully uh, completed the course. What I'd like to actually see is if you had on-demand assessments, that some of that funding wasn't simply when the provider said the student had, had completed the course, but actually when the student had passed the actual uh, assessment itself. I think that would be a powerful step forward for the nation to true performance-based uh, funding, uh, not simply completion-based funding, because right now I worry about some of the perverse incentives in place. Uh, uh, in, in some of those states if, if it grows too rapidly, to be uh, totally frank. But I think Georgia's done a good job, and then the infrastructure, Kelly, that you were telling me to, today, uh, to get all the schools up from three megabits per second to 100 megabits per second uh, over the next year, I think will be absolutely critical. The, the, the encouragement, I will say, is that your neighbor to the north, North Carolina, uh, has done a very good job leveraging its own higher ed uh, infrastructure to uh, create broadband infrastructure to all the district offices. The critical challenge is then getting that to the actual schools themselves so that there's enough uh, uh, pipe, if you will, there to actually do it. And, and I'd encourage all uh, local teachers, schools, and so forth uh, to get on Education Superhighway or, or uh, what the State Education Technology Directors Association recommends and just take a quick, simple broadband test to get an actual picture of what capacity is across the state today. Yeah. Back to your common core, I think you hit it on the head. We, we just evaluated all our schools and gave them rankings. Yeah. And that's going to be sort of like when uh, Sonny Purdue had his graduation rate, we went to the cohort rate. I think we're going to see the same thing when the common core results come in. But on your assessments, I agree with you, a six hour test or eight hour test is long. <coughs> but if we did away with a lot of these other tests that we do during the course of the year, maybe that's not so bad. Uh, that, that's my question to you. I, I'm trying to understand the alternative to yeah. Park and the other group because to me, the big issue of Common Core isn't the standards, it's going to be the assessment. And I think that's what you were saying as well, I believe. But what, I don't quite understand the alternative that you're throwing out there. Yeah, so, so let me just repeat the question so everyone hears it, which is, um, the, first there was an observation that it, with Common Core, uh, once the results come out, there's, there's agreement that this will be an interesting uh, 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 Reality. A reality check, if you will. Um, but the second, the second point was, so get that the end of, uh, make sure I'm saying it right, but that the end of course, or, or sorry, sorry, end of year assessments are probably not the best way to go about it. But what's the alternative that I'm, I'm actually proposing? Um, so let me be very frank here. I actually don't think there's an alternative that exists today in, in actual practice that is good enough to do what I'm, I'm saying. So let me be very direct on that. Um, my sense is what we want to move toward is an assessment system that is literally bite-sized and can be on demand so that as students uh, master standards and prove that to their teacher, they can then take the assessment to validate and prove that they've actually mastered those sorts of things, which is a very different infrastructure of assessment for the country. Uh, for those of you, how many people are familiar with Western Governors University? So a handful of people, I'll, I'll just give a quick overview. They're an uh, online learning university founded in 1999 by the 19 Western governors that is competency-based, um, largely. Um, they, uh, the, the way their assessment system works is that um, students don't move on based on credit hours, although they have to map it back because of some problems with, uh, with regulation. But, the, um, but students actually uh, progress once they can prove mastery of a given concept. And they have two types of assessments. The first kind are what they think of as objective assessments. These are just things that are more of the sort of straightforward bubble tests and so forth, right? To just say, do you know the basic content knowledge? Do you have sound grasp of that? And the second set of assessments that they have are what they call performance assessments. And they have a separate set of faculty that's completely separate from the faculty working with students 
who grade those sorts of projects and writing samples and things of that nature, depending on the task. Uh, and and sort of, they sort of act like capstone projects, if you will, whenever you master a set of, of, of things. And my sense is that you, you're going to have some sort of, as opposed to thinking of the one assessment, we're going to move to a system that's really a systems of assessments that allow you to uh, verify and validate learning in different ways. And, and how many people are familiar with NAEP? National Association uh, Assessment of Educational Progress. Um, did I just screw up that acronym? That's good enough. So, um, the, uh, it's, 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 it's in effect the, um, the national test that we've had, but the way that it does its work is it just samples a few hundred to thousand uh, students in a given state or district, and it just says, how do those do as representative sample of how the, uh, of, of how the area is doing, of, of how the rest of the region is doing? And in effect, from that sampling, you can get a feel for, uh, this is how we do our comparisons, right? To say Mississippi has incredibly low cut scores because on the NAEP they do terribly, even though the, on their assessments they say there's dramatic proficiency. That's how we are able to make those comparisons. And my sense is you could use a NAEP-like sampling just to allow lots of different providers to have different sorts of assessments. But you could track once, if, if they're not tracking the NAEP assessments, then you could say, that that's actually not a viable option to assess to have innovation and assessment because we can see the deviation is not in fact living up to the standard. So that's my sense for where we ought to be going in the future. I don't think we're there yet, and I don't know who's going to solve that problem. Uh, people have speculated Khan Academy might be part of the solution. Uh, people have speculated that ACT and in, in moving away from the Common Core um, might be trying to solve that problem. Uh, and so forth. I, I don't think we have an answer at this point, though, to be totally frank. Uh, I, I'd love to see one of the state virtual schools, quite frankly, spin out an assessment uh, infrastructure to do some, something like that. Um, but, but I'm not sure we have an answer, to be totally frank. So, Sajid. Michael, um, your theory of disruptive innovation when applied to industries identifies winners, those that have embraced or the, the disruptive innovators, and then losers, typically incumbents that have not failed to embrace it. When you apply to education, um, online learning and some forms of blended learning are the disruptive innovators, the winners. Who do you guys then see as the, the losers in education as a result to the, to the theory? Yeah, um, so, the, so Sajin's um, question was uh, that in the theory of disruptive innovation, uh, what it basically says is that uh, startups typically come in and disrupt incumbents uh, that typically can't respond to disruptions. It's been less true in some fields as of late as, as incumbents have understood the mechanisms for disruption. They've been able to do it themselves in some cases, uh, which is great. But, but in education, the question was, who are the winners going to be and who are the losers? And, and I think he answered the first question by saying that the online learning and several of these blended learning models uh, will be the winners in the future. Who will the losers be? My, my sense is, and we just put out a paper, as you know, uh, about a week ago, um, talking about this, which... I'll uh, unabashedly say it's actually my favorite thing I've written since disrupting class. Um, but the because uh, it was just really enormously clarifying for me to think through it, um, in which we basically uh, very clearly said we do not see online learning disrupting schools. Schools will still be the future. What we see is that online learning is disrupting the traditional classroom as we know it, and so that traditional classroom structure in which we've delivered instruction for a traditional class in a factory-based system, I think that's going to fall by the wayside in, in, in the long run, uh, particularly in secondary schools. In elementary schools, we see less of a disruption story taking place, but particularly in middle and high schools, my sense is that the traditional classroom and actually a few of these rotation models in the longer run uh, will not be the dominant few, uh, way of schooling. So I think that the station rotation, lab rotation, and flipped classroom models are really sustaining innovations to the traditional classroom and won't be the big future uh, in the long run of learning and sort of represent this hybrid interim stage. Um, my sense is in terms of other losers in this, I think uh, textbook companies are gonna have a, just a very difficult time with it. You already see purchasing behavior changing quite dramatically from saying we want the one curriculum to saying we wanna modularize, we want a chunk of this and we want a chunk of that and we want this to be able to package it together for our students in different ways. And so I think that's going to be really uh, quite punishing um, for, for, uh, for students in the future. Sorry, for, for textbook companies in the future. Um, and then the last part about it, I think that the, um, 
so, so there was a provocative speech that I wrote about in my Forbes blog uh, a few weeks ago given by uh, someone at a conference that you may have been there as well in Arizona State, uh, which was an investor conference in education in which they effectively said, when all other technological transformations have rolled through, uh, there's been massive loss, loss in jobs. And his conclusion, therefore, was that teachers are on the cutting block. My sense is that teachers are not on the cutting block, uh, but my sense is that the job of teachers is going to change dramatically. And that's going to be the big shift. And so if you think about that as a different job, then sure, the role of the traditional teacher, lesson planning to in a one-size-fits-all way to a classroom, that is going to go away. The job of the, new of the new teacher, I think, is going to look different in different ways, and we're still learning about that. But I think it's going to be much more around mentoring and motivating and coaching, helping to answer on-demand questions, facilitating small group discussions and projects, uh, <coughs> assessing and so forth, um, and being able to help find resources to deal with individual needs as they arise. Um, and I, my sense is that it will occur much more uh, as teaching as a team sport. So rather than having teaching being a very isolating thing where we close the classroom, you're not with any of your peers during the day, and you're just with 30 students, and you don't get that sense of camaraderie and so forth at your peer level, my sense is in the future, actually, you're going to be working with teams of teachers all the time, uh, where maybe you can specialize in the thing that works best for you, or maybe you'll be in an environment where you're all generalists. I don't know. I think it'll depend on the model. But I think that's actually a really exciting future of where this is going. Uh, and you wrote a great piece, and I'll end on this thought, but you wrote a great piece uh, when Waiting for Superman came out about how the problem, in essence, with the uh, movie Waiting for Superman was the title. Because we can't wait for Superman or Batman or Flash or whomever, I think, is, was what your lead was. Uh, because right now we're expecting teachers to do just way too much to educate students in the system. And my sense is that digital learning, as it grows, uh, will allow teachers to really specialize in the things where humans need to be involved and, and, and allow computers to do what ought to be automated. Um, and, and that's my hope for where this goes ultimately. So I think we have time for maybe one more question in the back and, uh, and, and fire away. Part of the common core, aside from the content, is having all of the tests being done being replaced from a paper-based system to online. How many states have that infrastructure in place? And what do you think is going to happen in 2014-15 when the technology breaks down and we can't really get a good assessment regardless of what the learning is? Yeah, so the question was, part of the uh, Common Core shift is also these assessments to be online uh, in 2014-15. And my assessment of where states are from an infrastructure perspective of being able to handle that switch um, and what will happen when that, uh, if, if that goes awry. My, my sense is, as the question, I guess, led me, uh, that most states aren't ready for, for, for that sort of a uh, uh, massive shift of assessments online, which is why I think the competency-based learning to go into these bite-sized assessments would be a much more productive way uh, and would save the common core, I think, um, but also in a way that would dramatically boost learning. Um, the uh, second point um, of what will happen when it crashes um, which I think it will in many states, um, is I, I think a couple things are gonna actually happen. One, um, I, I think in the, the assessment consortia are also creating paper-based uh, assessments, such that there's an, another alternative to doing the assessments online. So I think you'll see a lot of people revert to those sorts of old assessments. The second thing I think is once states sort of fully appreciate the costs of what this is going to take to get from here to there, in some cases, I think you're going to see many states drop out of the Common Core. And I actually, this may be hearsay, I'm not sure that's a bad thing for the Common Core. Um, because A, I think it'll make it very clear then it's not a federal takeover of our standards. Because it'll be, I mean, by the definition that states have opted out, will just show very clearly that it's a state-led initiative. And I think that would be a good thing right now. Um, and secondly, if you have very passionate states that are really committed to doing the work it takes to do this right, I think it would be better to have a group of, say, 30 rather than 45 doing that. Um, and so my sense is you are going to see 10, 15, 20 states drop out in the next couple of years. Uh, that, that, that's what I fully expect. So thank you so much. Apologies I missed the questions, but uh, we'll, 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 keep, we'll keep talking. Thank you so much.